Hello, good afternoon, uh, excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this day today has been a long day, but it has, um, it has reinvigorated our commitment for the cause of justice and, the, and for the cause of truth. And here, um, while I'm thanking uh, justice for victims of 1988 massacres in Iran, for organizing this event, I would also reaffirm my commitment and to assure what Tahir just mentioned, that my mandate will not give up. We will continue to support and seek justice, accountability, and truth. This is my promise to you, and this is the promise from my mandate. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We have today heard harrowing stories, testimonies of the victims, the survivors, their families and friends about the tragedy of the 1988 massacres. We have also heard um, experts, um, my own colleague is here, the special procedures, how we want to ensure that justice is done. The episode of what happened in 1988 is deeply painful to all of us. As you all know, the 1988 massacre in Iran refers to the systemic, systematic, and widespread extrajudicial executions and enforced disappearances of political prisoners during the summer of 1988. While there may not be consensus on the number of individuals who disappeared or were executed in 1988. As we have heard, there is substantial, overwhelming, and indeed irrefutable evidence that thousands of individuals were summarily uh, and extrajudicially killed and arbitrarily deprived of their right to life. This was in violation to the most fundamental of international human rights instruments, uh, including the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 3, as well as uh, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article 6, to which we must remind the Iranian authorities that they, they are a party and they were a party in 1988. As I mentioned this morning, the 1988 massacres resulting in the summary and arbitrary executions, as well as the enforced disappearances, have been a source of very serious concerns for me as a special rapporteur on the human rights situation in the Islamic Republic of Iran, as well as my other esteemed colleagues in the UN special procedures. Some of you may remember, and I think we have already made reference to that, to, to the late, great Asma Jahangir, and my colleague uh, uh, is here, who mentioned that as well. Um, Asma Jahangir noted in her report to the UN General Assembly, and I quote her, she stated that overwhelming evidence shows that thousands of persons were summa summarily killed, and she highlighted the right to a remedy including what she said, the right of uh, an effective investigation of the facts and public disclosure of truth and the right to reparations. I think these are very important statements. I mean, carefully look at what she is saying, that there must be a right to an effective investigation uh, of facts, public disclosure, as well uh, as the right to truth and the right to reparation and remedies. And these are some of the elements which I will highlight in, in my recommendations uh, later uh, in this presentation. Again, as already mentioned today, in, in a 2020 communication to Iran, a number of United Nations special procedures, including my own mandate, expressed strong concerns at what we call uh, the alleged continued refusal to disclose the fate and whereabouts of thousands of individuals who were reportedly forcibly disappeared and then extrajudicially executed in 1988. This communication goes on 
to note that enforced disappearance continues until the fate and whereabouts of the individual concerned are established irrespective of the time past and the family members have a right to truth. And again, today's um, discussions have been important because we have been discussing with my esteemed colleagues that there is a need for us to have a follow-up on the 2020 communication. And that we will do uh, to again remind the Iranian authorities that there is something uh, they are hiding. They are hiding the facts and they are hiding the truth. And we know, uh, we want to know the reasons and we want to highlight before the Human Rights Council. Again, um, I think this has been mentioned, the UN Working Group on Enforced or Involuntary Disappearances in a report to the Human Rights Council in August 2022 expressed concerns about the ongoing concealment of burial sites of those forcibly disappeared in the 1988 massacre. The Working Group notes, and I, and I repeat their statement, whereby the working group, in quotation, reiterates the concerns expressed by the ongoing concealment of burial sites of those forcibly disappeared and allegedly executed between July and September 1988 across the country. The working group recalls that an enforced disappearance continues until the fate and whereabouts of the individuals concerned is established and repeats its support for an, in, an international investigation on that matter. End of quotation. Now, in the light and in the face of such overwhelming evidence of international crimes, most notably crimes against humanity of torture, persecution, murder, extermination, and forced disappearances, as well as the crime of genocide, having been committed the big question that we need to address is how have the Iranian authorities dealt with this issue? And I know Tahir has already very eloquently mentioned what we know, but for the sake of the record, I want to um, state the following, that after the 1988 massacre, the tragedy of 1988, Khomeini's willing executioners who had ordered these mass arbitrary executions were indeed rewarded and were promoted to high positions in politics, in judiciary, and within the judicial and domestic framework of the country. And as we know, many of these remain in that high-powered position as of today. The current Iranian president, as we have uh, referred many times today, acted as a member of the death committee and many witnesses have already made reference to his role in mass executions of 1988. So what do I have to say to the international community? I implore upon the international community, in particular members of the Human Rights Council, and I hope that there are some delegates still here with us. I implore upon them to listen to the vi voices to the pain and grief of the victims and survivors of the 1988 ma massacres and to act judiciously, judiciously but decisively to ensure justice and accountability fully in accordance with international law and respecting the right to a fair trial. Now, one possibility, again, that has been alluded to by Tahir but others as well, is that of the use of universal jurisdiction by states to try individuals for serious crimes, including crimes against humanity and other serious crimes um, of international law and serious human rights violations. As you know, in July of 2022, a Swedish court convicted Mr. Hamid Nouri for his role in the torture and mass executions in the Islamic Republic of Iran during 1988 as the court found him guilty of war crimes and murder and sentenced him to life imprisonment. This decision, as many of you would know, was upheld on appeal in December of last year. Again, uh, the subject of trials in absentia has been raised today and uh, previously. 
Now, if the trials in absentia do take place, and if they are accompanied by fair trial guarantees, there could be a future possibility of ensuring justice and accountability. Ladies and gentlemen, I have on numerous occasions called upon the international community for the establishment of an international investigative mechanism um, or an international commission of inquiry to ensure accountability, but also to establish the truth and ultimately the justice for the victims of the 1988 massacres. In my mind, this mandate of the investigative uh, tribunal or the commission of inquiry would focus on the massacres of the 1980s, in particular the summary extrajudicial and arbitrary executions of 1988, as well as the enforced disappearances from that time onwards. But, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that in addition to an investigative mechanism, the International Commission of Inquiry, important as it is, it should not be an exclusive mechanism to ensure justice and an appropriate closure to this grave tragedy. Therefore, in parallel to the international mechanism, the commission of inquiry or the investi investigations, the international community, and again, I look towards the Human Rights Council, to s that the international community and the Human Rights Council must seek the establishment of what I say a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Because ultimately, we are also looking at establishing the truth and a dignified closure to this issue. So what is going to be the role of this um, Truth and Reconciliation Commission? To, to my mind, this would include, amongst other things, A, to provide a profound, sincere, public apology and acknowledgement that thousands of persons were murdered extrajudicially, arbitrarily, and sum summarily, and thousands were forcibly disappeared. There must therefore be an apology, a sincere statement coming from the, from the state itself that those persons were wrongfully, unlawfully, and unjustly executed or remain and forcibly disappeared. Number two, the authorities must provide all relevant information to the relatives uh, of the victims and their loved ones. This information must include an honest and truthful explanation of what happened to these individuals. Number three, publications of details and name of all persons who have been executed or have been enforceably disappeared. And other relevant details, for example, uh, where these individuals are buried, what has happened to their graves, uh, what has happened to their remains. Tragic as this sounds, the victim's death must be acknowledged even retrospectively. They must be given a dignified end and therefore their, the state must provide truthful and honest statements as to their deaths, not what we have heard today about you know, hiding and lying about their end. Some, some saying just death, some saying causing, causing of natural death, and some giving no explanation to their families at all. Um, again, uh, just to repeat, establishing fully the complete honest truth behind this massive tragedy where people are still suffering. suffering. Number four an absolute commitment on the part of the state or the authorities to cooperate with the victims, the survivors, and their families, including allowing them to appropriately mourn the death of their loved ones. And here, I'm also looking at those people, you people, who have suffered for decades and you have received nothing but threats and intimidation. And people, um, the MEK people living in Albania and what we heard from Tahir once again, there must be a closure to all these tragedies and victimization and harassment. And the state has to recognize 
that it has to be inclusive of those who, who have suffered and time has come to, for them to be included in a dialogue and cooperation. Number six, by implication to what I have said, immediate end to the harassment, intimidation, or targeting of the victims or their survivors and their families, and ending of a state policy of consistent reprisals and killing as of today of those who question what happened in 1988. And, and we have colleagues here who keep sending me information and communication, communications about individuals who are still put in prison simply because they want the truth, simply because they are seeking justice for their loved ones. That policy of the state must end. Number seven, they have to invite victims' families to visit the graves of their loved ones and to facilitate and provide, again, with all of the relevant information as to what happened. Number eight, the state has to introduce, in accordance with international law and international guidelines, a policy, a sustained policy of reparations and all appropriate remedies for the victims, the survivors, as well as the families of those who were executed or enforceably disappeared. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, I will say this, that there must be accountability, there must be justice, as well as a mechanism to finally reach to the truth and a closure to this deep and painful wound which is still with us. Thank you very much.